I Fred Carter of uh, University of Akron, i program. This is powered by the Youngstown Business Incubator's Evolve Technology Program. My name is Chandler Fiffick, and I'm the director of that program. We work with any tech-based or tech-enabled startup uh, based in Northeast Ohio. So if you would like more information on our services and how I can help your company as well as my team, please reach out. Uh, you can either, I'll put my email in the chat and I will tell you that it's ybi.org slash evolve if you want to apply. We are lucky today to have Fred Carter here. Like I said, he is an instructor at the University of Akron's i program. Ted is, or Fred is also um, an expert in launching products for Fortune 500 companies um, and leading customer segment development teams. Also a business owner in his, um, in his own time, I guess your spare time, Fred. <laughs> right, right. So anyhow, I will let him take it from here. He's going to do a presentation and then uh, a question and answer session when he's finished. And Fred, why don't you just go ahead and start? Okay, great. Thank you, Chandler. And uh, and, and if uh, anybody needs to jump in and ask questions, uh, feel free to add those to the chat. I'll try to keep my eyes open on the chat. Uh, and, and Chandler, if you see something pop in there, I, I could use your help as a, a wing person in that process too, because I want to make sure that we address anything that comes up during this. And um, please keep yourself muted. I'm sorry, Fred, When if you are not asking a question. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so today we're going to talk about, you know, why customer discovery is, you know, highly relevant to startups. Uh, as it, yeah, Chandler was talking about, you know, I am an entrepreneur, you know, I, I run a business day to day. I also do contract work, you know, for University of Akron Research Foundation and the i -Corp, and the and most specifically within the i -Corp program that they run there, uh, in that I help them find teams, e either from the uh, universities across Ohio or from the, the community. And, and then I help to instruct uh, in the, the coursework that we present to the, the groups. And it, while we touch on a lot of different things in that i -Corps program, a lot of that, it really is focused on customer discovery. And a, um, and, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that later, but really what I, I hope to get in there and show you is why the customer discovery is so important in some of the pitfalls that occur during customer discovery. So you're aware of those and perhaps can avoid some mistakes that uh, I'll give you a few examples too of some very large companies that, that didn't do it well and what happened with them. So, you know, customer discovery really matters because we, we need to validate the ideas that we have for, for business and research. Uh, we, we see it on a very regular basis that, uh, teams uh, of business people will come up with an amazing idea that could be in a business incubator it could be in a uh, in a research uh, department at, at a university and they say wow this idea could change the world and they work on that idea and they start to build around that and maybe they're starting to spend money on that idea and often they've checked with very few true clients as to uh, how do they feel about this idea or is this something that they even need or would acknowledge as something that would improve their lives or uh, somehow take away a pain that they're currently experiencing? So, the, you know, the big takeaway on, on this particular slide is that, you know, customer discovery it, in a very large way matters because it's going to help prevent costly mistakes and in, in investing money up front into uh, how you want to market and how you want to take your idea uh, out to people. So, Customer discovery is really all about validating assumptions and understanding what your customers' needs and behaviors are. Uh, and, and it's really important because you want to make sure that you actually are servicing a real need. And, and, and we understand that you know there are some you know, industries out there that we, we know, yeah, there's a need. Yeah, you know, people need insurance, people need people to fix their roofs. But even within those industries, there are innovators and there are startups that are saying, hey, how do we change that? You know, progressive. You know, back in the day. So how do we how do we you know reevaluate the clients that we're talking to? What do we provide that's of real value? And they were talking to clients and they were saying, you know what, we we, we hate having to call three different places to get an insurance quote. And that wasn't what they expected to hear necessarily. But as they were cluing into that, it could drive in deeper on those needs. 
they, they figured out a, a true advantage that they could bring to the market and, and that helped propel them forward. Uh, so three key concepts that I'll, I'll touch on here in doing customer discovery uh, or avoiding bias. Uh, bias has a way of creeping into our processes. I, I think most of us uh, are aware that we have them. We all try to probably avoid them, but uh, until we actually have a process and maybe some even oversight of our processes, uh, it's, it's hard to really stay away from them. But those biases can creep in and it, it really put deviations on the information that we have. You know, they, they can um, they can slant how we how we feel about things and how we go to market. Uh, I'll give examples of that. Uh, uncovering real pains. Uh, it's easy to assume again that that we you know, we figured out where someone wants to solve a problem. Uh, you know, we'll just take for example. You know, say you're talking to someone and they say, "Hey, the uh, the lighting in my office just hurts my eyes." And you're thinking, "Okay, great. Let's put some softer lighting in their office." Well, without maybe pulling back and asking other questions, it might have turned out that their answer had nothing to do with and how to solve their pain had nothing to do with changing the lighting in their office. It, it, it could be that they have a vision impairment and they needed to see a doctor. So un learning how to under uncover the pain and how they relate to that pain, it can often you know, show whether or not you're actually going to help them uh, you know, mitigate it and improve their situation. And the, the third concept that I'll, I'll, I'll cover with you is defining real clients. And, and for our purposes here, and I, and I think in a really large way, we need to understand that you know, clients, clients are people that, you know, they're not businesses. It's not the building they set in. It's not the greater organization. When we think about clients and customers, we need to think about the individual people in the roles that they're in so that we can start to understand what makes them tick, what's important to them. Because within a business, you've got a lot of different stakeholders and you've got a lot of different um, uh, people that with varying opinions. But what you really need to find out are the people that are most important to you and the most important to your business. And, and I'm saying business because I'm so uh, accustomed to talking in the business world. But I, I also want to make sure that this is it goes for the same you know, thing if you're talking to, to homeowners or, or to, to households. You know, you're not talking about you know, uh, oh, okay, I got 10,000 households that are my clients. Well, the, what you probably have are 10,000 people within households that are your clients that are buying potentially for a myriad of reasons and understanding what those different types of decision makers are and, and what their motivators are will be really important to making sure you're efficient with how you approach them. So some you know, common biases that, that we run into uh, a, are, and, and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll dive into a little bit of the science of them, just for folks maybe that haven't heard of these before, because uh, there, there's there's dozens of them out there, and depending on what resources you check, you, you'll hear about a lot of them. But I'll cover a couple of the common ones. Uh, confirmation bias is one that, that we see continuously in the i program, and that's where uh, the people that are going through the program say, hey, I know I've got a great idea because I went out and I've asked a bunch of people, hey, do you like my idea? Well, what ends up happening is because they ask leading questions and they sort of coax their audience into telling them, yes, that's a great idea. And yes, that does solve my problem, but they haven't actually asked them without leading them to find out if there's anything else out there that could be a competing you know, idea in their minds or a competing pain for them. Uh, so confirmation bias you know, is swaying their, uh, their responses to you and swaying the data that you're collecting. Uh, selection bias it, it has to do with you know, collecting improper uh, sample sizes or samples that don't really represent your overall population. So you could go out and say, well, I'm going to serve all of Youngstown. Well, it, you know, but then you actually go out and you only talk to 50 people that were sitting at a country club one day in Youngstown. Well, that's not really representative of all of Youngstown. There's a lot more people and, and it's a very diverse population there that you need to speak to. So selection bias is something we need to be aware of in our process and whether or not, you know, we're really being open or it could be the other way around. Are you being specific enough because you know that your product or your service is very uh, limited in the potential scope of clients? Uh, there's another one that uh, that we run into sometimes, too, called social desirability. And that's a tendency of the respondents to, to give answers they think are the correct moral answer. Right. So. If you're offering something like a service that helps people with mental health, 
it's not uncommon to have almost everybody you talk to go, oh, that's a great idea. Because what they ultimately are thinking of is, I want people to experience less mental health illness. So any idea is going to sound like a, a great idea right now. But uh, but what they're kind of doing is is just agreeing with you because they want to see that, you know, that uh, you, they want to see people get healthy, but not necessarily that they think that your idea is a great idea. Uh, and then you know, what ends up happening is we gather these different types of information that's coming back to us, right? You know, and if bias is creeped in there and say we're we're charting out our answers and we're being really diligent about, okay, we've done some research here. We want to make sure that we've got good data because maybe we need to explain that to uh, somebody who's going to offer us a business loan or a grant or uh, business partners who want to make sure we've got our focus right. Well, if we've let these type of, of biases um, creep in, they can... Uh, it can really kind of you know sway that data and set us off on the wrong foot, and again potentially waste a lot of money. Uh, and there are uh, there, there you know different techniques to mitigate bias, uh, such as making sure that we're not talking to in the, the picture in the bottom right there is supposed to be my grandma and grandpa, uh, but you know we're not talking to just grandma and grandpa, and they're going yeah that's right Freddie uh, you know any business that you launch right now is going to be amazing, and I, we think you're you're awesome. You know, they're they're obviously have all kinds of bias if we're talking to family and friends because they don't want to hurt our feelings, right? So we need to make sure we're talking to people that are new. You know, we we want to make sure that we have processes that then gather that data and track when we mean we maybe we ask different questions and we want to know how if we've pivoted on the types of questions we ask and and uh, what we're trying to find out from people. And it is exceptionally helpful if you have outside peers and mentors that will help you through this process because often they can take a step back, you know, and these would be people you really trust to give you a critical view and say, you know what, no, you really are kind of leading them on and that you're getting some confirmation bias in there or maybe you really haven't asked the, the you know, the proper group of people about this that you're really trying to focus on. I see we've got some chat questions coming. I don't want to get too far ahead. Is there anything up there right now? Uh, no, you're good. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I'll give you uh, some real world examples here. And uh, so we've got a couple of them listed there that are obviously products, you know, Segway and Google Glass. These are these are basically household names for a lot of families across America. These are also, you know, products that, that failed, right? So Segway was started around 2001. Uh, I think they sold off to uh, foreign overseas interests that even stopped all production about seven or eight years ago. Uh, but, you know, one of the major problems they ran into with bias was confirmation bias. They're very certain that the inventor, uh, his name was Dean Kamen, uh, he was so... Um, he was so optimistic about it and that it projected this sense that everybody would love it. And the people that got interviewed and that were kind of checked in on as their potential clients, they kind of reflected some of that back to them. They reflected back the um, the, the positive nature and the energy that their, their, their inventor had. And that influenced bad data into the process. Uh, they had uh, selection bias because they also had uh, groups that they mostly talked to were these really small, enthusiastic early adopters and insiders within the industry, but they weren't talking necessarily uh, to the bigger groups that they really should have been talking to. Perhaps the the families that might travel to another city and want to rent for five or six of these for the day to travel around a downtown area or to see a, a park they've never seen before, which is where ultimately they tried to move a lot of their market where to do was to doing a lot of these. Uh, exploratory kind of events and, and to you know, sell these to outfitters of, for, for group exploration. Uh, but they uh, they really didn't ask them during the initial fact finding. And, and that really swayed a lot of how they did development. It swayed how they, they, they actually made their product uh, and the, even the quantities that they anticipated to be able to build to. Uh, they had... Uh, yeah, so they also had, which overlaps a little bit with confirmation bias, but the social desirability bias in this group, where they had such positive feedback from such a, a uh, select audience that they let that 
um, and that feedback coming off the charismatic personality of Dean, uh, they, they let a lot of that feed into how they were going to go to market and they really over anticipated what the need would be. Um, ultimately, they ended up with a product that was a high cost, had a lot of regulatory issues that they hadn't explored because they didn't talk to the people in the markets that would have known, oh, by the way, if we put so many different people on these things, we're going to have maybe you know some city halls that are asking questions. We're going to have people involved with uh, safety devices that are going to have ask questions. They didn't get to uh, a lot of these issues until they were in market, had some production set up, and suddenly we're injecting lots of costs and uh, having to hire specialists that they just didn't anticipate. Uh, so, you know, even though that became a, a household name there for a little while, Segway didn't make it because they did have a lot of bias and they didn't have the right information that they gathered. Uh, Google Glass also suffered from confirmation bias. Uh, they were highly, highly enthusiastic about the potential of this, you know, wearable technology. So if you don't know, Google Glass were, it were like the, the glasses that have little screens inside of them. Uh, so they, the wearer could see the screen, but, you know, ideally not the people around them. So they kind of have their own screen on their face. Uh, and uh, what they found out was it, they, uh, they looked past all kinds of critical feedback uh, and they overestimated the consumer readiness for it because they were going out in a, in a fashion that kind of led on their, uh, they kind of led on the people that they were talking to. They, they were saying, oh, this is going to work. This is going to do this. They, they were basically telling them to, yes, reflect back to us that you like this and this is going to work. Uh, their selection bias, you know, it was very similar to segues. They talked to early adopters and tech enthusiasts. That didn't work out so well for them because their market was much bigger than just a few early adopters that quite frankly, if you're familiar with how some of these tech companies get out equipment, those early adopters in the big tech enthusiasts that say perhaps have these YouTube channels and so forth, it, they're giving that stuff away for them to get that publicity. They, they needed to be talking to the people that could potentially buy this. Uh, and then they, they also had some issues with social desirability. Uh, and it, they, uh, the initial people they were talking to really thought that, oh, this would be very prestigious. But again, a very limited selection of people that didn't right reflect the overall uh, environment. And what they didn't talk to were people that might not normally do this and when they did finally get to them, they found out, oh, they wouldn't wear this stuff. They, you know, uh, you know, and there's all kinds of, you know, reasons for that. People feel, oh, they're, someone's going to label me as a geek or a dork because I've got a screen on my glasses. Uh, but it was a real issue. And it, and it basically, you know, was the reason that that, that uh, company has yet to, well, Google is a success, but the Google Glass within that hasn't been successful. Now, you know, we can, you know, look at, at, a, at a couple ways that companies did this right and Slack and Apple iPhone uh, really you know, took a different approach to this. Uh, in both cases, very, very user-centered designs, very deliberate. We're gonna be meticulous about how we ask questions, what we're asking about. We're not going to lead people. We are going to make sure that we talk to a, a huge range of individuals and they put in levels of oversight into that to make sure that the people asking the questions and doing the sampling had ways to you know, be alerted if they were going off course. Um, because of this, and they also adopted iterative processes where they, they didn't give up on that customer discovery. Each time they wanted to make a change, they went back and said, okay, well, we've made a change. Let's document that there's been a pivot here and let's keep measuring and let's keep you know, checking in on do, you know, do people really want this? And why might they want this? Uh, so bear with me here. Sorry, just had my screens drop on me. There we go. So the importance of pain points in the conversation I want to have with you today really is that in general, people want to avoid pain. Uh, there's been a lot of studies that have been done that prove over and over again that people are much more likely to take action to avoid pain than to find a gain. You know, if I can avoid you know, wasting three hours of time, you know, I'm, you know, and that is time that is really important to me. I'm more likely to do that than if I think, oh, I might make an extra 20 bucks in my day. Right. So pains tend to motivate people a lot more. And so we need to make sure that we're at least giving it, you know, uh, 
we're at least giving credence to them and what you know what's motivating people and finding out what why is it that they might want to change yeah because we might have something that improves their life uh in in a uh in a gainful way but again the pains are where it's at and really to get to these pains you need to have conversations with people and it's similar you know to what we're talking about with the bias you know if you open up and say hey is this a pain well you, you may not get really accurate information people might agree that they have a pain just because uh, you know, they won't agree with you, or they, they may say that they have a pain because in some limited way they can identify with your pain. What's much better process for finding out these kind of things is to have open conversations with people about what is their role and what's really important to their their day-to-day -day activities, whether that's as a mom in a family or as a CFO in a company. You know, what kind of, you know, what kind of uh, responsibilities do they have? Who are they responsible to? And then you start to find out, well, you know, what kind of challenges do you have when, when you're working in there? Because we all want to improve where we are and we all want to make sure that you know, we're, we're you know, coming up uh, to meet the challenges of our other stakeholders in our, in our groups. So uh, that's where you start to really dive in is by having these open-ended conversations, having, asking open-ended questions you know, that aren't just yes, no answered. And you'll start to uncover what really makes people tick and what might bother them. But ideally, you don't want to ever start there, like I said, with saying, oh, this is a pain. Do you have it? Because they may have it, and it may, but it may be minimal. And you may have missed a really large pain that you could have helped them solve. Uh, so it, 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 I'll give you an example of this. Uh, when it comes to organizations that are having issues with employee loyalty and turnover, uh, sometimes uh, I've talked to smaller organizations. They said, oh, well, we think... Uh, you know, this is happening because of you know, we, you know, we we don't have health insurance, and because of this, you know, uh, turnover, uh, we've got all of these training costs and you know, having to rehire and advertise jobs, and my HR is constantly, you know, stressed over this, uh, and you know, the the pain, you know, is the health insurance now. Uh, what you have as an organization and what you're offering to them may not be health insurance. You, you might be finding a way to, it, well, like, like in my business, my day-to-day -day business that I mentioned earlier, I help companies reduce their business costs. So often when I'm told, you know, by someone, oh yeah, this pain that we have, and, and I find it often, you know, we want to buy health insurance. What I can tell them is, oh, well, it, yeah, it, it, tell me more about that health insurance pain. Why does that really matter to you? What's the, the dollar amount like that look like? And then I can start the process. Well, can my process of reducing other costs in their business help them save enough money to fix that pain, because sometimes you're not fixing the pain directly, you're giving them the tool to fix the pain for themselves. And that can be really empowering and, and, and really powerful for them. So some strategies for uncovering the real pains. Uh, yeah, yeah I, you know, you wanna conduct some hypotheses. It, it, that's my biggest suggestion is start out by making some assumptions and then start testing them. Uh, you know, take some guesses, you, you know, who, what, what kind of problems are they really running into? And then you might be able to lead your questions uh, while not telling them what answers to give you, but you might be able to direct that conversation to, you know, getting to those pains if, uh, if you know a little bit about how they operate. Uh, asking open-ended questions is a really powerful thing. If people keep responding to you with no and yes and maybe, well, you haven't really asked them the the who, the what's, the when's, the where's, the why's that get them to really tell you about them. And my uh, my, my third strategy that I listed here, this observing customer behavior, is really powerful too. You know, getting a chance to see someone face to face or bare minimum through Zoom, you get to read body language. You get to see if someone cringes up because you just hit on a real nerve, and it, you, you get you get a chance to dive in a little bit deeper versus if you ask someone a question and you know you look at their face and they're kind of aloof you, you get the idea that yeah they you know you're, you're not hitting home right and you're not getting to something that's important to them next so uh, th I think those are some great ways to get you started on uncovering pains so the other part uh, of the uh, you know the recommendations I had for you you know was you know Defining who your real client are, keeping in mind they are people, you know, it's it's Jim in accounting or at least the CFO or the head bookkeeper 
or the mom in the family or you know dad in the family the 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 teenager in the family you cuz what you'll start to do is realize that all of these different roles have different reasons for why they want to potentially make a purchase they'll have different pains different things that aggravate them and it, you can start to build profiles of what it's like to encounter these people because not every conversation you'll have with them it, it will be direct eventually you may have conversations that are going to be really more of a one way street where you're communicating to them through you know, marketing on the internet, billboards, TV, radio, those kind of things where they don't have a chance to give you feedback. But if you've known a little bit about what makes them tick and what their psychological makeup is, you've got the opportunity to really talk to individuals that have that uh, that, that you know, motivation to, to buy from you and to support your organization. Uh, and then understand that there are different, you know, levels of, you know, clients. And it, what you might find is that some of them, uh, Let's just say you need to sell, uh, you know, you say you're selling Xboxes, right? You know, I want to sell video game machines into families. So you, we think about, you know, maybe you're even wanting to sell Xboxes. We'll say the two 11-year-olds. Well, does the 11-year-old have the money to make the purchase? Probably not. It's going to be mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, somebody like that, right? They're going to be the customer. But you're going to have an indirect customer in that 11 year old that you need to get excited about it that needs to get the parents on board so the parents say yeah there's a reason to buy here you know there's there's a connection we want to uh, we want to make this person happy so we're going to be your customer so understanding uh, what that map looks like and it can be really different for uh, organizations uh, and, and if you might imagine for a minute and you know, I got a picture of, of like an operating room up here on the on the screen you know just to put in something like the lights up above you know, you just imagine how many different influencers were involved in that. You probably had maintenance people. You had surgeons that wanted to say, well, I want that light a certain color, it, as in the light that's beaming down on them, it, you know, and, and it's affecting how they can perceive the body on the table. Uh, you may have uh, decision makers in the finance department that say, well, we we think other companies can do the same thing for the maintenance and the uh, and the surgeons, but do it at a different price. Uh, you've got a lot of different decision makers. Even the, the blankets on the table have a lot of different decision makers because you're, you're affecting you know, other um, you know, household duties within the hospital and, again, other stakeholders. So being able to map that out is uh, is pretty important. And, and one tool that I'll mention offhand that's really good at that, actually, is a, a system that I've used for years called the Miller-Hyman Blue Sheet Selling uh, System. And it's great at helping map out who stakeholders are. So uh, I like to toss that out because that, that was really helpful to me, actually, when years ago I had to get into the medical industry. And often there were seven or eight uh, different decision makers that I had to make sure I had buy-in from. So when you want to get started with customer discovery, what we really suggest, you know, again, get back to having a process. Know that you're going to be repeatable each time you have an interview uh, with a potential client. Uh, generate some hypotheses. Don't be afraid to, to test your assumptions. So if uh, you might say, well, I think uh, my client has the ability to spend you know, so much money. And you say you think my client has the ability to spend $10,000 on the thing that you want to sell. Well, test it. See, well, maybe they actually have the ability to go for 15. So go big. See if they got the ability to do 20. And then start pairing it back. And you might find out that a thing you thought you could sell for $10,000, you could really sell for $15,000. But you started by testing your, your hypotheses and your guesses about what uh, you know, what that marketplace might look like at, at a higher uh, higher dollar amount. Uh, you're also going to test hypotheses you know, directly about who are my clients. And you're going to find out at times they're not exactly who you thought they would be. And, and I'll give you a good example from the i in this spring's cohort we had a team that came up and said, oh, we've got this cooling uh, technology. We want to take it out to people that can uh, refrigerate foods and other perishable devices on a very large scale because we think that they're going to love this. Well, they started interviewing them. They found out there wasn't so much love there for it. They had different competing uh, technologies and different uh, uh, economic pressures that it wasn't really a fit for this cooling technology, even though the, the technology was amazing. They didn't have to plug anything in and they could control the temperature of a given space. But through those conversations and having meaningful conversations with these people, they started just dropping on them. Why don't you talk to people that are in the outdoors industry? Why don't you start talking to people that 
are trying to take bait out to go fishing or people that want to go backpacking or camping and they got to keep some perishable food, you know, safe for a few days, or maybe their medicine safe while they're in the field. And boy, did those suggestions that came through asking these repeated questions and, and testing where they thought the market was, they found out that they could pivot and find a whole new market that quite frankly was a lot larger than what they originally thought would be available for them. So uh, making sure that you don't introduce those biases and you stay open is a really powerful thing because you can get feedback you absolutely weren't expecting. Uh, you know, and then obviously identify the tools and the resources that you want to be consistent with. Uh, and and actually, this is about the point that uh, Chandler, I, I'd like to to pivot uh, and talk a little bit about ICOR, uh, but I also want to open it up really quick in case anybody here uh, has a question because I don't want to get too far away from the, the core material before talking about how ICOR can do customer discovery. Yeah, that's that's perfect. If anybody has a question, just come off mute or put it in the chat if you're shy. We'll give you a couple a couple seconds here, and then Fred, you can just go on into sure. iCore. Well, I'll go ahead and move into that, and and I've actually got another screen in there later for Q and A too. But uh, just you, grab those questions if you've got them. So. As I mentioned, you know, I, I do some recruitment and instruction for iCore. Uh, what iCore is doing is uh, it is essentially providing mentorship and guidance. Uh, a structured curriculum and team collaboration around the customer discovery process. ICOR what has been around for, for more than a dozen years. Uh, and in Ohio, we have a regional version of this program uh, that is ran by the University of Akron Research Foundation in partnership with uh, some members out of uh, Toledo University. Uh, but we primarily house it out of the UARF. And it is an extension of the NSF's uh, I-Corps program, and we we cover all four corners of Ohio with this, both university teams and uh, and teams from the community, businesses. Could be a business that's already up and running and wants to figure out how to pivot and identify new markets, and this could also be a uh, a business that's right there at the startup phase and is like, wow, I really need to figure this out to make sure I really nailed down who I'm talking to and if I'm going to market the right way and to the right people. So we, we do have a team of, a, of instructors that meet with each class and they're available during offline hours. And this is a virtual experience. And we also try to align mentors. We invite teams to come with their own mentors. So if they're already working with someone at, at a program like Jumpstart or YBI, by all means, we'd love to have them bring along with them. But we also have some mentors that we can loan to teams. Uh, in most cases, we're able to align that. And again, those are people that kind of help keep you on track and maybe answer some questions along the way. Uh, there is a very structured curriculum. While we've done some iterative fixes to how we uh, delivered over the years and to respond to things like COVID, we've got a, a very solid program that has really stood the, the test of time because we focus so much on the basics in refining how to pull out bias and how to really be objective about the information that we're bringing back. And one of the, the cool things about i also is the oppor opportunity for team collaboration and for being able to meet other people. Uh, so you, in a lot of the teams that come into this, there are scientists, there's engineers, there's business people from a ton of different disciplines. And you get a chance to meet them in, in the week-to-week -week process that we go through with i -Core. And those people are typically open to accepting outside conversations it, you know, and collaborating on other things. And it could be a great way to network. Uh, some other advantages of the i program is it, people that participate in our program uh, are often given better opportunities for grants. Uh, we know that people that complete the regional i program have a much better chance of securing uh, opportunities with, uh, with federal grants and, and other grant programs. The, um, it, we've often seen the percentages uh, triple and quadruple of, of the, the grant acceptance rates. Uh, again, the networking opportunities, you know, just happen through the process. And uh, if if you if you go through it and you haven't networked at all, it's really on your own shoulders because we set it up in a way that you, there's tons of opportunity to connect to people. And and really doing this market validation, you know, is ultimately why most people initially want to do it, right? They want to. 
They want to know, am I going to the right people? Am I talking to them about the things that are really most meaningful to them? And uh, did I put that information together in a way that it's really consistent and, and, and has a, a format that's conveyable to other people and shareable? Now, you know, this program that we have, again, was founded by the National Science Foundation, but is certainly open to non-science related programs. Uh, we've had people come through that have uh, mental health uh, companies and nonprofits that they're trying to start, people that are working with educators and already had pre-existing business, businesses, but wanted to come out with a new tool for educators and, uh, and maybe approach the education system a different way. Uh, we, we've really seen people, even with, with uh, trades-related companies, uh, like uh, lawn companies and uh, outfitters for going down rivers. So wide spectrum, even though our roots were with NSF, we're really open to any sort of business or concept. Uh, so we've been running this for about 10 years now through the regional program here in Ohio, put more than 450 teams through there. And we're really seen across this uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur ecosystem as a reputation builder. Uh, when people go through our program, they get recognition for that. People understand what that what that is and what that means to uh, invest their time and do that diligence of going through the program and learning these skills. Uh, and what that really looks like is basically seven weeks of virtual sessions with some weekly assignments. We run three cohorts a year, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, we've got participation, again, across the state. Uh, and, you know, this is something that is going to build skills uh, for your toolbox, as well as, you know, even if your initial idea doesn't take off, you've got tools that you can now use to put on a resume uh, and to present to other folks. Even if your startup doesn't lift the, the way you hoped, you're going to have learned some very valuable business skills. One of the best things about this program, though, is we don't charge for it. If you're accepted into the program, which there is a very high success uh, a chance of success if you apply, uh, you've got the opportunity to, to earn uh, $1,000 uh, for going through it. And again, you're not going to have paid us anything for it. And at the end of it, we also have the uh, an iPitch competition for you know some of our standouts that would get invited to this with another opportunity to, learn, to earn up to $2,000. Uh, and this, again, opens doors to many other grant opportunities and other experiences, uh, as well as other resources that we help our teams tap into as we learn about them and they're going through the program. So again, key takeaways here, you know, uh, be really aware of bias and how that can creep in. You know, it is, it is something you got to keep working at. And even after years and years of being through courses and people telling me about bias, and I've been in business for almost 30 years or in some sort of business for almost 30 years, I know I still fight against it. Uh, you know, always be aware of where the, your client's real pain points are. So you can really talk to them about how you're going to improve their lives. And then make sure you're defining those clients accurately. Who are they? How do they fit together? What are, you know, what are those motivations? Uh, and then don't be afraid to walk away and say, you know what? We learned that this just isn't the right place to be focusing and we need to pivot and look somewhere else. Uh, so I will open this up again for Q&A. Uh, my contact information is on the screen. As a recruiter and an instructor in the program, you're welcome to call me. I'd be glad to talk with you about personal fit and more detail about how the i program works. Uh, also glad to help you through if you decide, hey, I want to apply, but can someone help talk me through the, the application process? I love to do that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'll also make sure that Chandler has this available because I know she's going to post some video, but it, just in case uh, you want to get your hands on the, the PowerPoint itself, I'll make sure that that's available. Yeah, I'll send the slides out to all the attendees um, as soon as I get them. Okay. Anybody have any questions? All right. Well, I appreciate you participating today. Hopefully, you, you, there's a few things in there you got to take away. And but uh, and again, just reach out. I uh, uh, love working with everyone. And uh, you know, even if we don't find a fit with you there, maybe there's something else I can help get you plugged into. Uh, and uh, we've got some other resources at UAR that sometimes are a fit if you decide you don't want to take the full leap into the I Corps program. We have a question from Jose. Is this only for Ohio residents? So it's a great question. Uh, you, uh, this is not only for Ohio residents. Uh, there are regional programs across the United States. And if Jose wants to connect with me and he wants to participate in an i program that's maybe uh, in a different region, I'm glad to help him align with the resources where, wherever that might be. I've seen the thumbs up. So good there. Yeah. yeah give, reach out to me, Jose. I just want to add that I have sent a number of 
my portfolio companies through this program. It is fantastic. I can't say enough good things about it. It provides so much value and for free. So it's all it is, is a time commitment, but you know, if you're going to be starting a business, you should get used to that <laughs> anyhow <laughs> and not a large time commitment either. Well, thank you again, Chandler. It was really it, great to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Fred, that was fantastic. So again, this will be posted on ybi.org slash evolve. If you would like to contact me directly, I'm going to quickly put my email in the chat. Um, cfific at ybi.org. But other than that, thank you for coming. And again, Fred, I really, really, really appreciate it. That was great. Yo, I'm glad to have done this. Thanks for making the opportunity. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye.